The family of a Midland student murdered in France say the police aren't doing enough to catch the killer. Crime Stalker takes up the case after Central News. I got chills, they're multiplying, and I'm losing control. Those new yogurts you're supplying, they're electrifying. electrifying. Better shave up. There's more fruit and bio to keep your taste but satisfied. New St. Idle Shape. Ladies and gentlemen, it's good news. DFS make you an offer that will not be matched. Britain's leading upholstery specialist offers you a huge choice of sofas, settees, chairs and suites. Factory direct prices on everything we make. A guarantee of quality and free delivery. And right now you can choose anything with confidence, pay nothing until September. No deposit. No interest. No payment. And, and then, then take four, four years interest-free interest credit. credit. An offer that will not be matched from DFS, Britain's leading upholstery specialist. Mmm, what's so special tonight? Wait and see. Ba -ba -ba -ba, everybody's heard about the word. Bird's eye, bird's eye, chicken's the word. Discover the secret of new bird's eye chicken en croute. The flaky pastry hides a rich sauce and a center made with succulent chicken breast. Bird's eye, chick, chick, chicken's the word. The bird's Only eye, chicken chick, worth chick, celebrating the passes the bird's eye. Chick, chick, chicken's the word. The Macro 25th birthday sale starts Saturday, and to celebrate, we've got 24 cans of Skoll Lager for only 9.79, including the AT. All you need to join the party is your Macro trade card. Ladies and gentlemen, from the fastest growing name in dog food, Butcher's Tender Cuts! There are no artificial ingredients, they're natural, what's more? There's plenty of protein and vitamins galore. To keep your dog fit and healthy, there are no ifs and buts. You must give him what you think is good for him, give him Butcher's Tender Cuts! Butcher's Tender Cuts, meaty chunks in a delicious gravy. <laughs> is your dog as fit as a butcher's dog? St. Ivel Shape Extra Fruit. Good evening, now the news from Central. A family has criticised social workers after learning their son's body may have lain undiscovered for over three months. He was last seen alive in November when he cashed a benefit cheque. This afternoon, Gillian Philpott was trying to come to terms with the horrifying thought that her son might have been lying dead since November last year. Police were called to his Wellington flat when a visitor noticed that a telephone directory left on his step hadn't been taken in. Inside the living room, they found 27-year-old Daniel Philpott slumped in a chair. Dozens of unopened letters were lying in the hallway. We can't say how long he's been there. All we can say is that he was last seen on the 1st of November. Daniel's mother says her son was a quiet man who had a history of mental problems. Does it upset you that he could have been lying there dead for so long? What about Christmas? Well, I wonder why he didn't get a Christmas card, but I know he didn't like Christmas much, so I thought perhaps he just didn't bother to get any. Daniel's older brother had tried to see him last year, but he never answered the door. Who's to blame? Well, social services. I mean, he, was, he had social workers. But then they obviously didn't question anything. We're very sorry to hear about it, uh, and our sympathy goes out to the family. Nevertheless, are you concerned that somebody might not have seen him since November from your department? Obviously, one has to be concerned about that, and we will be looking into the circumstances. Our involvement was on an informal basis with Daniel. Police say they're not treating Daniel Philpott's death as suspicious. Detectives have tonight issued a warning about a lethal drug after two addicts were found dead. Tests are now being carried out on the killer drug. The latest victim was found dead in a toilet block at the Guildhall Market in Derby City Centre. He was 20 years old and a known drugs user. 24 hours earlier, the body of a 27-year-old addict was found in a Derby men's hostel. 
he died in his bedroom. At first, they were both thought to be overdose cases, but two deaths in two days is unusual. Police suspect a pure strain of drug is responsible. I'm worried that out there is uh, a batch of drugs that is of greater purity than what the drug addicts are normally used to. Now, they've got no way of testing for purity, and it could well be um, that there might be more of this drug out there. The addicts, who are very, very vulnerable people, um, need to be aware and to be extremely careful where they're getting their drugs from. A message backed by drugs experts who say unsuspecting users are at serious risk. If the concentrations of the substance changes, and if it becomes a highly concentrated substance, then the threshold of the drug uh, uh, breaks the limit and the drug becomes lethal. Police are now waiting for the results of forensic tests to establish the exact nature of the killer drug. Three children are tonight being praised for their bravery after throwing water over a man engulfed in flames. Kevin Bold is now in a critical condition in hospital with extensive burns after the house fire at Utoxeter in Staffordshire. Finally tonight, camel racers in the Middle East are hoping for a leg up from an English company. Heart monitors used to test the fitness of racehorses have been modified to give the sheikhs a head start. Far from the desert sands, Linda Phillips has been busy modifying her heart monitor for horses. Deep in the heart of Worcestershire, secret testing's been carried out at the West Midlands Safari Park on Humphrey the Two-Humped Camel. And it's all for a very special customer, because Linda's been commissioned by a Saudi Arabian sheikh to produce a monitor for his racing camels. Well, we've been selling monitors for horses for quite a long time, about 10 years and I got an order to make one for camels um, from the Middle East and I wasn't really too sure how uh, it fitted on the camel so Beaudley Safari Park kindly let me come and test it on the The sport's as big in the Middle East as horse racing is here. Prestige is at stake and anything that gives an advantage is eagerly snapped up. With a heart rate monitor you're able to test fitness levels and to know whether you're uh, working the horse too hard or not hard enough and um, so it does give the uh, trainer uh, an advantage um, to just see how fit the horse is. Um, or camel. Oh camel, yes. <laughs> and did Humphrey mind all this uh, going on? No, surprisingly he didn't. I thought he was going to be um, a bit difficult to handle but he's uh, been lovely and uh, very cooperative. The camel racing season started last month and a prototype belt is already in use. The shakes certainly seem happy with it. Humphrey, though, looks like he's got the hump. That's all for now. We'll have the next bulletin from Central News at 6.15 tomorrow morning. But from the Late News team, have a very good night. Central Weather, sponsored by Stay Bright Windows. The clear choice, whatever the weather. Hello again. Temperatures don't know whether they're coming or going at the moment. A frost last night, bordering on the mild for the next couple of days, and then straight back to cold, even snowy temperatures later on Sunday. I can't keep up with it. For now, it's relatively mild, with a front pushing down from the northwest through the night, so no worries about a frost. Temperatures no lower than 4 Celsius. A few spots of patchy, drizzly rain making it into the north of the region towards dawn. And then patchy rain spreading down the region tomorrow morning. Now this front's going to be fizzling out as it travels, so it'll be little more than a band of cloud by the middle of the day. With some brighter weather already pushing in from the north there, which will make things much drier and brighter for all of us for the afternoon. And temperatures an improvement just above the average. 8 Celsius is 46 Fahrenheit for tomorrow. That's it. Good night. The Central Seven Day Weather Line, 0336 404010. He's romantic. <laughs> Mr. Bendy wants to visit Schnabelland. He's bold. And who called the Super Stud chat line? Incredibly sexist. Remember, a man's castle is his pants. Understanding. Nicky, go upstairs. It's depressing enough when you're happy. Offensive. Well, I'm not paying for mistakes. I've been doing that since the day I got married. Russ Abbott. OK, everybody, gather round. Married for Life, beginning Tuesday the 5th of March, 8.30 on Central. I've tried it every day for two weeks now. It is good. It's very good. Very good. It's extremely good. Extremely good. Oh, yeah. Two 
weeks, Anders. Good. Really? They're talking about Kellogg's All Bran. It's very high in wheat bran fiber. Make it part of your complete breakfast for two weeks and see how you feel. You should try it. I'm going to try it. Good. Kellogg's All Bran cereal. Try it for two weeks. Love it forever. It's one of the most underrated things in life. Ladies and gentlemen, it's good news. DFS make you an offer that will not be matched. Britain's leading upholstery specialist offers you a huge choice of sofas, settees, chairs and suites. Factory direct prices on everything we make. A guarantee of quality and free delivery. And right now you can choose anything with confidence, pay nothing until September. No deposit. No interest. No payment. And, and then, then take four, four years, years interest-free interest credit. credit. An offer that will not be matched from DFS, Britain's leading upholstery specialist. When a tall, handsome guy seeks a slim, blonde babe, it promises to be a brief encounter. He's not coming! He's not coming! Uh, uh, of course he's coming. He, he's just delayed. I, uh, I expect something's happened to him. Mine hasn't turned up and I'm not crying, am I? I will do when I get home. I'll probably strangle the goldfish. Josie Lawrence and Paul Merton star in Sealed with a Loving Kiss. Friday at 8.30 on Central. The time is set. The day is set. The place is set. Can I challenge you? What, 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 no, the no, duel no, is on. If you can't control yourself, sir, you shouldn't come on these debates. Being the referee's my job. Can I ask you for that? Verbal <laughs> shots are flying in your Friday debate at 10.40. Central Weekend. An investigation into an unsolved murder now on Central in the February edition of Crime Stalker. On Crime Stalker tonight, is the killer of this girl still at large because of bungling by French detectives? I was um, very surprised that there was no cordon. It was like that, uh, there was no murder. My investigation reveals a catalogue of blunders and incompetence in the case of a murdered British student. Good evening and welcome to Crime Stalker. Also on the programme, the agony over ecstasy for the family of Leah Betts. A special report into the private grief behind their nationwide anti-drugs crusade. Yes, good evening. Well, we'll be rejoining John out on the streets of Nottingham in a few minutes. But first, a look at some of the crime stories we need your help to solve. This is the face of a youth who raped a teenage boy at knife point. Police say he's got to be stopped. This man held up a building society with a shotgun. Do you know him? And this gang of robbers hit two petrol stations in just one hour. We need their names. Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, killed 13 women. Today, his face is being used to make a killing for the distributors of true crime videos. They say they're simply reporting the facts. Victims' relatives say it's sick. So should the true crime industry be banned? That's the question for our Crime Stalker jury tonight. But first, now imagine it's a quiet evening at home, you're sitting in watching television, and the next second you're face to face with four masked men. It's a nightmare that became reality for the Websters from Lapworth in Warwickshire three weeks ago. Now, Pauline, you came across the Raiders in the hallway of your home, didn't you? Yes, that's right. I was upstairs, I heard a noise. I came downstairs and I was confronted by one masked man initially. Um, he rugby tackled me to the floor, handcuffed me. Um, he said he wanted the safe, he wanted everything that was in the safe. He had my husband, there were obviously other people about, I could hear my husband in the kitchen. Um, he said if I didn't do exactly what I was told, um, they would slash my husband's throat. Must have been absolutely terrified. And, and George, I mean, obviously you were going through quite an ordeal as well. What was happening to you? Well, I rushed out of the kitchen when I heard the, the noise and I immediately hit one of the raiders and he got hold of me, then another one got hold of me, forced me to sit down, mm -hmm. they put my head between my legs and all the time they were threatening to cut my throat if my wife didn't do as she was told. 
Now, Pete, you're investigating oh. this, this case. Sounds like a professional gang, doesn't it? Yes, I think so. It's taken them just 20 minutes to get away with £80,000 of the property and you've heard the ruthless way in which they behaved. We're now, the, the property, actually, they stole jewellery, didn't they? This is, and we've got replicas yeah, there. We've got a replica there of um, a Chopard Happy Diamond mm -hmm. watch and a ring that was stolen. All the jewellery is from uh, Kaczynski, which is a jeweller in Knightsbridge in right. London and is identifiable to them. Okay, so this is what to look out for. Yeah, what we're really looking for from people is to help Mr. and Mrs. Webster and ourselves, we need to detect this offence. We need to make sure we don't suffer other offences. Mm -hmm. um, somebody somewhere out there knows what's happened. Somebody knows about the property. So there, there is, is a, a reward, isn't A there? substantial reward available, yes. Okay, well, I hope you catch these men. And Pauline, George, Pete, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. This is the face of teenager Leah Betts, a face used by her family in their personal campaign against the drug that killed her. Whilst most of us would have sought privacy and time to grieve, her parents have turned their agony over ecstasy into a national crusade. They call it Leah's legacy. But at what cost to themselves? Tonight we go behind the scenes with the bets on a day of massive public exposure, the day of their daughter's inquest. 10.53 and 10.89 a.m. Interactive radio for the UK. Talk Radio. It's 8.24. Listening on the line, I hope to uh, what Keith Halliwell had to say, is Paul Betts. Drug taking is on the increase, and the age is getting younger. And Paul Betts gives the first of many interviews on the day of his daughter's inquest. We have got to accept we have got a drug problem. Now, until we do that, we won't. And he's saying that by 2005, 80% of 10-year-olds will have tried drugs. Jan and Paul chose to embrace the media from the very beginning of their tragedy last November. From ITN News at 10 with Julia Somerville. The message to every parent on the dangers of drugs. My daughter paid £10 for this pill. That's very likely to cost her. <coughs> Her life. Break up the family. The Beth's appearance at a press conference alongside a photograph of Leah strapped to a life support machine sparked a worldwide debate on the dangers of ecstasy. Leah Betts' parents finally let doctors switch off her life support machine today. Leah's ordeal is now over. She was pronounced dead. In the very early hours. Since Leah's death, there's been little chance for private grief. Paul and Jan have openly wept and laid bare their emotions to expose the drug that killed their daughter. They'd both like today to be different, but no, it can't. It's a um, private day today. But, but it won't be. No, it, it can't be, and for everybody's sake, all those kids that are still thinking of taking drugs and stuff, we've got to get through it. The media interest has certainly placed the Betts' marriage and family under enormous strain, but they're confident they'll survive. We recognise the fact if one or other of us needs our own space, then, then we get it. If one or other of us needs to cry, then we cry and support the other one. Sometimes we cry together. You have to accept the fact that you've been through a massive emotional experience. I think, if anything, it's, it's kind of reinforced the value of family love. Paul can find some solace amongst his animals on their small holding. But even this solid and stoic former policeman suffers at times. Sometimes it's hard because when both of the, there come times when both of us are down, and when both of us are down, it's very difficult, particularly for me, to suddenly turn around and sort of feel sorry for Jan because I want to feel sorry <laughs> for me. 
Long as we knew more. The local vicar and his wife have offered to drive Jan and Paul to Chelmsford for the inquest. I was called in the day before Leah died and um, their grief has been so genuine and so deep but somehow or other they've redirected the energy of it towards the benefit of other people and it's been wonderful really to be associated with them. It's basically the end of a chapter. We've gone through Leah's life. We've gone through chasing the drug scene. And now in many ways it's burying a ghost. Even the bets are stunned by the size of the media circus waiting for them below the steps of the Shire Hall. More than 30 journalists are there. The bets, as usual, remain calm, courteous and patient. The media have been extraordinarily helpful. And the way that they treated us, I've got no complaints whatsoever. They've been brilliant. They've been our mouthpiece. We couldn't have... Uh got any message across That's without right. them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just over an hour later and the inquest is over. Okay, the verdict is accidental death. Our chapter has closed. We've gone the full circle with Leah. It will never, it's a void, it will never be filled. She died from ecstasy poisoning. The coroner has brought about a verdict of accidental death due to non-dependency on drug abuse. I can't argue with that. No, no that's fine. I think uh, he's, he said it all. No, that's great. While reporters scramble to assemble their story, Paul and Jan give yet more interviews. That legalising of death. And no, we can't go down that road at all. Physically, how are you both feeling now? Knackered. Weak need. <laughs> Completely and utterly shattered. And it hasn't finished yet. No. Thanks. Thank, Thank you very much. A live satellite interview completes the bet's commitments in Chelmsford. Not too. The couple, commended by the coroner for their strength of character, wearily make their way home. There to greet them, a BBC outside broadcast unit, preparing to beam live pictures from their sitting room. Before that, another radio phone in, Bye. and the pressure on Paul begins to show. GLR. <laughs> I'm going to take a day off. I'm in. I'm going to take a day. Coming up, the coroner. But it's just seconds before the bets go live to millions of viewers from their sofa. Ecstasy has is a problem within itself. I'm sorry, I've lost all sound. OK, well, Mrs. Betts, can Hello. you hear me? Hello, Mrs. Betts, can you hear me? No. Yeah, um, yes, yes. Yes, you can, about... you can hear me. Yes. L let me ask you... Uh, uh, this... Sorry. That's all right. That's all right. I, I lost it completely. I yeah. couldn't hear anything. Paul and Jan, by now, old hands at the precarious live link interview, take these technical faults in their stride. Do you think we should follow... And just after eight that night, over 12 hours since their first interview, the bets bid farewell to the BBC. Bye. Well, they've finally gone. Yes, they have. It's been quite a day, hasn't it? It has. It's the end of, as we said, a chapter, and hopefully the start of another. And the big sort of problem we've got now is that now, for all intents and purposes, the story of Leah has finished the media will gradually lose interest. And so what we've now got to do is to make sure that they don't forget. Not so much Leah, but the fact that ecstasy kills. I think we need a break um, in order that we can get ourselves look into the future. But no, we won't let it rest. We can't let it rest. And you can't half do something. When no. we decided to uh, make Leah's tragedy public and try to show people how dangerous ecstasy was. You can't play at it, you've got to go for it 100%. And that's what we've tried to do. And a lot of control. The coroner, Dr Malcolm Weir, said that if this tragic story prevented even one more fatality, Leah's death 
will not have been in vain. Terry Lloyd, ITN, Chelsea. Paul and Jan Betts, they're a very brave and dignified couple and we wish them the best of luck. Now, the true crime industry is worth millions of pounds. The bigger the killer, the bigger the killing. The face of the Yorkshire Rippers being used to market a new collection of home videos. And the same company is offering a free gift, the trial of the American serial killer, Jeffrey Dahmer. It says it's films are serious documentaries, but relatives of some murder victims say it exploits their grief. Should the true crime industry be banned? That's the question for our crime stalker jury and for you at home. Our lawyers John Taylor and Jan Yelema will now present their cases. Members of the jury, just imagine if it was your daughter, sister or mother who had been raped and then murdered by some pervert and then some little grubby film company wanted to make money out of showing a video of the way she was slaughtered. Just imagine how you would feel to know that a video was being sold as home entertainment to some moron who'd pay money to gawp at it. Now, no respectable face could be used to market such stuff, which is why the evil face of the Yorkshire Ripper is used to promote this particular garbage. Don't be confused. This is not about education. This is not about solving crime. This is about making money, blood money. And it's an insult to the dead victims, an insult to the family, and an insult to justice. Jan. Members of the jury, no one can fail to have immense sympathy for the family of victims of violent crime. But can it be right, or even sensible, let alone practical, to call for the draconian censorship of all subsequent books or films about such crimes. Is extensive newspaper reporting of a trial at the time any less exploitative than a subsequent book or film? If not, then why ban one and not the other? How will you ban one without the other? In this same net, you catch investigative series such as the Rough Justice programs because arguably they too use or exploit crime for the purposes of entertainment. It's simply a fact of life that people are interested in that which happens around them. That's why newspapers exist. Now in matters of human tragedy you can't pick and choose what is news and what is not. Neither can I suggest should you subsequently try to dictate which parts of that news can then be the subject of documentaries, books, films, or whatever. Members of the jury, this proposal is motivated by emotion. It does not stand logical scrutiny, and I ask you to reject it. Members of the jury, you'll be familiar with the work of best-selling author Joseph Womble, the author of books such as The Choir Boys, Several of his books, The Onion Field, Echoes in the Darkness, and The Blooding, are actually books based on fact, based on crimes. Under this proposal, those books would be banned. Uh, Mr. Wombaugh joins us on the telephone from San Diego. Uh, one who writes about a crime does not destroy the privacy of the victim survivors. Murder destroys the privacy of the victim survivors. I wrote a book rather than a newspaper story, therefore I did it with more depth, more research, more investigation, and I brought more experience and I think more insight into it. In your book, The Blooding, you described the way in which Dawn Ashworth, who was only 15, was attacked sexually and murdered. Yes, and I described the way um, the other victim was murdered as well and the thoughts of the, of the killer as he did it, and, and his very words uh, that he uttered to the police, yes. And you know that that caused great distress to both families. Is that not right? I can't imagine anything uh, 
be, uh, causing any more distress to the parents of, of children who were slaughtered. I think it was very important that people understand uh, the mind of the violent sexual sociopath. Mr. Wombo, Mr. Ashworth, the father of Dawn, wrote to you telling you that your book caused his family much distress. When I interviewed the Ashworths, uh, I, I begged them not to read the story that I was going to write because it would bring pain. But, but of course, I knew that they would. You've been sure. uh, put to task by uh, John Taylor with regard to the reaction of the uh, Ashworth family. But yeah. can I also uh, ask you, just please, to mention, if you would, the reaction you had to your book, The Onion Field, from the family of the uh, murdered policeman in yes, that book. I am friends with the surviving uh, parent of the murdered police officer in the Onion Field. They attribute to your book the fact that uh, the murderer, Gregory Powell, is still in custody. The murder Gregory Powell attributes uh, to me <laughs> the fact that he's still in prison, and so does his lawyer. They said that more horrific crimes have been committed when people were paroled. And it's, the, it's the, my book and, and the, the fame of the book that kept him in prison. Robin Ashworth, you're the father of Dawn, who was 15 when she was the victim of a sex attack and then murdered in 1986. Now, you've heard what Joseph Wombourne has said. Did you realize that he was writing a book in which he would describe the way in which your daughter was killed? No, I didn't. He didn't tell me that at the time. What did you think the book was going to be all about? Um, he was particularly interested in the DNA aspects of uh, uh, capturing Colin Pitchfork. And uh, I g we gathered that that was what uh, he was going to be writing about. If you'd known he was going to describe the details, the gruesome details of her death, would you have consented to the interview? I wouldn't. Uh, and I don't think he should have had the gruesome details. I think this was the first case in which someone was caught and convicted as the result of what was then pioneering DNA genetic fingerprinting. Yes, uh, I've got no objection to that aspect of uh, uh, this particular yes. crime. Well, but what I object to is the, the glorification of this type of crime. Yes, can I suggest to you that this isn't glorification, it's having to go into the detail to make sense of what was forensically a, a huge milestone case in, uh, in the administration of justice in catching criminals, both in this country and worldwide. Would you accept I've, that? I've got no answer to that. Can I introduce here Professor Ellis <coughs> Cashmore, uh, a sociologist who has made a particular study, I think, of the effect of television on the community as a whole. Uh, Professor Cashmore, there might be those, I suspect, who would fear uh, that these sort of videos might cause copycat murders, copycat crimes. What's your view of that? I, th I think the purported link between television violence or video violence and actual violent behaviour has been exaggerated, frankly. There's divided opinion. There's always that doubt about the effect on the criminal mind of such material. It's divided right down the middle. Uh, the particular link that we're talking about there have been in excess of a thousand empirical studies and it's about 50-50 those who say that there is a link, however tenuous, stick to their guns and say yes, it, there, there has to be a link between what people see on their screens and what they actually do uh, in their life and, uh, and those of us in the other camps say that uh, we're not convinced. Well, our jury will now retire to consider their verdict, and we also want to hear from you at home. So phone 0891 400 701 if you think the true crime industry should be banned, and 0891 400 702 if you think it shouldn't. Well, we'll catch you with our jury debate later in the programme. Now, though, Leicester detectives need your help tonight to identify a youth who raped a 16-year-old boy at knife point. This thug approached the boy at a bus stop outside CNA in Humberston Gate, Leicester, at 10 past 7 on Monday the 15th of January. He held a knife to his cheek, walked him to an alleyway at the back of the Swiss Cottage restaurant and then raped him. Mark, this was a shocking crime. First of all, how's the boy? Considering this was a vicious attack, his coping as well as can be expected. And the description of the offender? We're looking for a white lad who's aged between 16 and 18 years. He's 5 foot 9, slim to medium build. He was wearing a baseball cap which had an orange peak and black body. He had got thin features in his face with thin eyebrows. 
and he was wearing a leather jacket and dark jeans. After the attack, he took the victim's coat off and put it on himself, and that is described as a black leather coat, which is three-quarter length. And how can the public help? I'm appealing first for two ladies who were stood at the bus stop at the time that the young boy was abducted. They are described as both being white in their late 50s, early 60s. And I'm also appealing for anyone who may have seen the assailant walking the young boy along Umberston Gate, along Charles Street and along Lower Hill Street to come forward. Mark, he needs to be caught. I hope we can help catch him. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. West Midlands detectives need your help to catch a gang of robbers who hit two petrol stations within an hour. Here they are, just after 2pm at the SO service station on the Hagley Road in Stourbridge. Two of them distract the cashier, whilst the third sneaks into the office and raids the unlocked safe. An hour later, they strike again at the Short Cross service station in Hales Owen. This time, they wait for the shop to clear. When the owner appears, he's grabbed and held by one of the gang whilst the others raid the takings from the rear office. They escaped with over £5,000 and were seen driving a silver Nissan Micra. The registration began L867. The police and the RSPCA want to talk to this man. 43-year-old Joseph Birch has been banned from keeping animals for 10 years. He's allegedly breached the court order and committed a number of horse thefts in Warwickshire. Birch travels around the country visiting horse fairs. If you know where he is, call our crime line now. Well, by his appearance, you'd think our next villain could be more at home digging his garden than holding up a building society, but that's exactly what he did at the Alliance in Leicester in Ashby de la Zeus in Leicestershire. Notice the shotgun concealed in a carrier bag. He's also thought to have attempted to rob a NatWest bank in Colville earlier that day. He's about 50 and stockily built, he was wearing a trilby hat and thick-rimmed glasses. There's a reward for information leading to his arrest and conviction. Well, we're taking a short break now. In part two, we reveal the disturbing results of a special stalker investigation into the murder of a British student in France. Well, far from appealing for information about Joanna's murder, the police in Auxerre maintained a stony silence, telling the media virtually nothing about the case. The new Almira will take it for a test drive. Of course. Alone. Great fun to drive. Mm. Comfortable too. Multi-link beam suspension. <laughs> <laughs> Almira, the car they don't want you to drive. With Cheltenham and Gloucester mortgages, there are no valuation fees, no application fees. They don't insist you buy their buildings and contents insurance. They don't sell endowment policies. In fact, their mortgages have absolutely no strings attached. But what's really exceptional is that they come with up to seven and a half thousand pounds in cash as a gift. And because CNG mortgages are also available at Lloyd's Bank, they're even easier to get hold of. Ring 0800 333 900 and see how Cheltenham and Gloucester is run to make you richer. Whose idea was this anyway? Guys and chicks party. I thought you said it was cocks and hens, aren't yes, it? Yes, I know what you are, thank you. Mmm. Oh, that's nice. It, it's more Come um on. We're not all going as chickens, are we? Off the odd turkey. Where's the girlfriend? <laughs> oh, she chickened out. Mmm, no, that's nice. It's more um that's what I said. It's yeah, more... That's changed, hasn't it? So? More mm, that's more, that's um, more um it is, yeah, isn't it's it? More um, um, more, um, um, more, um yeah, it's more more. Um, more. <laughs> looking for a better magazine, one that's packed with more of the things you like, crammed with real-life stories, 
overflowing with affordable fashion. Bursting with readers' confessions, straight-talking health and the best buys around. Surprising, fun, more of what you want to read. Woman, why aren't you reading it too? This is the most wonderful Monday morning ever, and it was enjoyed by E. Nelson on the way to his first day back in work. Last year, this booklet also helped over 400,000 other people back to work. Call 0800 250 200 for your copy. Cal Van Harup, award-winning sportsman. I watch a lot of movies, sports programs too. On Emirates, the award-winning airline. right to make cash out of killers or should the true crime industry be banned our jury a deep in debate um, anybody yeah um, I'd just like to ask um, we've, we've heard a lot from both sides tonight um, about whether or not there's a connection um, between the uh, actual violence uh, on screen and off screen um, uh, but I'm still left unsure really from this um, which way to sort of think on that um, I would certainly think personally that as far as um, showing the actual um, commission of a, an actual crime couldn't really be helpful to, to anyone. If you ask your permission to have these things broadcasted or written, that have made things different for you. If I'd known what he was actually going to put in the book, um, and he'd done the courtesy of letting me have a read of it, uh, it might have made some difference. So you didn't get the chance to question him before the book no, came out? No, I didn't get the chance at all. Joanna Parrish was a bright 20-year-old language student working as a teacher in France. Six years ago, she was sexually assaulted and murdered, her body left floating in a river. The killer has never been caught. Now, you may have forgotten about it. The French police, it seems, certainly hope you have. They've refused to reveal details of their investigation, even to Joanna's parents. They began to suspect a police cover-up that the French gendarmes had bungled their inquiry and let the killer slip through their fingers. Well, is that possible? Well, I'm not one to be fobbed off by official denials, so I went to France to carry out my own inquiries into the parish case and could hardly believe what I found out. Even in winter, the picturesque French town of Auxerre is bustling with visitors and tourists. But next to the colourful tourism posters advertising Burgundy wine and the pleasure of life are those which reveal a very different story. That of 20-year-old Gloucestershire student Joanna Parrish. In the final year of her language studies, Joanna was teaching English at a local school but she also advertised private English lessons. On a summer's evening in 1990, she told friends she was meeting a new client outside the Bank Populaire in Auxerre's Central Square. It was the last time they saw Joanna alive. The next morning, her unclothed body was found floating in the River Yon at the village of Monato, four miles away. She'd been strangled and sexually assaulted. Joanna's parents, Roger and Pauline, travelled to Auxerre to meet officers of the gendarmerie, the French rural police, who were hunting the killer. We were met by the uh, gendarmerie at Paris and driven to the barracks at Auxerre. And we were treated quite well, um, but I must say that one of the things which we were very um, hesitant about was that the barracks were adjacent to the river which of course was where Joanna's body was found and we thought that was rather insensitive. And then you return home expecting to be kept up to date. We thought that perhaps every few weeks or few months um, we would be contacted by the authorities and we would be given some idea of the way that the inquiry was going. Several weeks later 
There was still no word from the Auxerre police. The parishes hoped they'd meet them at Joanna's funeral. They were wrong. The French detectives didn't even attend Joanna's funeral in Gloucestershire, which at the very least would have been a mark of respect. But it would have also been an opportunity to talk to Joanna's friends and relatives to see if they had anything which might help the inquiry. Yet the French police didn't seem interested. In the months that followed, the parishes found they weren't alone in being stonewalled by the French authorities. The inquest, which had to take place in this country when Joanna's body came back, was postponed on three occasions because the coroner in Gloucestershire couldn't obtain the information that he needed to hold the inquest from the French authorities. The Ozair police claimed that they were barred by French law from releasing evidence. And they did eventually release a file. It revealed virtually nothing. Just a few basic facts about the case and a few statements from Joanna's friends. Nothing about forensic evidence. Nothing about key witnesses. Nothing about likely suspects. By now, the parishes were having serious doubts about the case. I think it makes us very angry. It makes us very upset. We do feel, I think sometimes, that there is a cover-up going on. But what could the Auxerre police be covering up? Had something gone wrong with their investigation? Since they weren't keen to talk, I decided to go to Auxerre to ask a few questions of my own about how they conducted their inquiry and whether that had anything to do with Joanna's killer being still at large after six long years. The River Yon near Auxerre has changed little in that time, except the trees behind the crime scene have recently been cut down. Joanna's body was found floating just off a small concrete jetty about a hundred yards from the main road. The police believe she'd been dead for several hours when her killer brought her to the river and put her into the water near to the jetty at around seven in the morning. But is the theory correct? At 7 a.m. in summer, it's broad daylight. The riverbank is busy, often with the gendarmes themselves out jogging from their nearby barracks. The jetty is even overlooked by houses just across the river. Is it likely the killer would choose this spot to dispose of the body in daylight? Some believe not. With all the other risks that the killer took, that is just such a, 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 an added enormous risk to take. Um, it doesn't seem probable. Because of the, the layout here, it seems far more likely that the body was put in further up. There where the trees afforded some sort of protection from sight, the only spot which afforded any protection from sight, um, and, of course, given the fact that the body could have been in the water for several hours, that could possibly have given it the time to drift down to where it was eventually found. The, the importance of where the body was put in is this track which lies behind it. If the body had been put in beside the jetty, more or less where it was found, logically the killer came from there, from further up, from the main road. If the body had been put in the river back to where the trees afforded some protection, then he came from a totally different direction. It's not very much, but those few hundred yards from where the body could have been put in, if it was put in there or further up, tells you from which direction he came. Upstream, there's a campsite where a body could easily be hidden and a track where a vehicle could be driven without suspicion. I can't help thinking this would have been exactly what the killer was looking for. From here, it's just a few yards under cover of trees and bushes to the water. Joanna's body could then have been washed down the river to where it was found. In my view, this upstream theory warranted a full-scale forensic investigation, but didn't get it. Instead, the gendarmes concentrated on the downstream theory, preferring to believe that the killer disposed of the body in full view of the road, the jogging track and neighbouring houses. This then was presumably where they carried out their detailed forensic investigation. Or did they? When I arrived with the, the journalist, the body was there, just in the water, 10 meters from, from me. And I was um, very surprised that there was no cordon. Um, when the ambulance left to the morgue, it was possible for us to come here. It was like there was no murder. 
Within an hour of Joanna's body being removed, the police had gone for lunch and the site was being trampled by the public. But even before that, the inquiry was in trouble. Now we've acquired a secret police report which lists the people standing here a few feet from Joanna's body before either the senior investigating officer or the forensic team arrived. Now that list includes the mayor's secretary. Well, why was she here? The local fire brigade. Heaven knows how many of those. Why were they here? The assistant to the mayor. Why was he here? And the list goes on and on of people who had no cause to be here, who played no part in the forensic examination, and yet were possibly trampling all over vital clues. Now this is a useful aerial view of the Monoto region. Now one of the things that I found quite amazing is that the only area of search that I can find out in a forensic sense was that tiny little area around where the body was found and even that within an hour of the removal of Joanna's body was open to the public who were trampling all over it, children and so on. Now if I'd have been investigating this murder I would have cordoned off the entire side of the river from the bridge all the way around to the point where Joanna was found, there are two playing fields there, there are some tennis courts there, there's thick wooded area all the way around right to the weir and look properly, perhaps over a period of a couple of days with about 30 or 40 policemen, probably on hands and knees, right along this area all the way around looking for many of the clues which may very well have been there, including, remember, Joanna's clothes because they have never been found. In my book, there should then have been an extensive media campaign giving the public some specific details of the crime to encourage them to come forward with information. We know it works. I've lost count of the number of crimes that you've helped to solve by responding to appeals on this programme. But far from appealing for information about Joanna's murder, the police in Auxerre maintained a stony silence, telling the media virtually nothing about the case. Joanna met her new client the previous evening outside the Bank Populaire. It's likely that man was her murderer. The square would have been busy and there's a cafe just across the street. Someone might have seen the two together, might have seen Joanna's killer and not realised until they read the papers. But in Auxerre, it's not likely to be in the papers. I suppose that the watchword is secrecy. Um, whether it be the examining magistrate, whether it be the gendarmes, um, a certain amount is given to the press, uh, uh, one or two details, um, but there is nothing like the use of the media um, in a productive manner uh, that there would be in Britain. It's a question of trying to beat down that secrecy to a point where you might just get a snippet of information uh, and be happy with it. And that's the case now six years on. There are posters appealing for information and offering a reward. They were published not by the police, but by Joanna's parents, who went to Auxerre three years ago with their son Barney to hand out the leaflets themselves. Several local people made it clear that although they remembered what had happened, they hadn't seen photographs of Joe before. The posters did bring forward new information. The parishes passed it on to the Auxerre police but heard nothing more about it. It was time to ask the authorities some questions. Like the parishes, I was refused answers by the head of the gendarmerie and the examining magistrate who's in charge of the inquiry, but the public prosecutor did agree to see me. We have spoken to some witnesses who say that the scientific examination was very small and was not preserved for a very long time, less than one hour after the removal of, of the body. In England, we would spend much longer on that. Um, maybe it happened like that. Um, it happened, if it happened like that, uh, it's, a, it's a pity, yes. Uh, now we prefer and we try to make it longer. Another point of criticism is that the authorities haven't involved the press in helping detect this murder. Yeah, that's a, a French tradition, a French youth. Um, the inquest is secret. That's the law. We don't think 
that uh, the public could really help. The family say that they had to bring their own posters, their own photographs from England, which they paid for to distribute. Is that something that perhaps you regret? That's the responsibility of the family. Uh, the family thought that it was a good way to make uh, things go further. I'm not sure that it is putting photographs uh, on uh, trees or on walls uh, gave anything. One of the complaints is that the family haven't been told what the progress of the case is. Is that a fair criticism? I do understand the family and the, they are very painful. But it's difficult to tell them something new. If we were to get uh, very interesting information, they of course will be informed. But that's not uh, the case. Well, I've spent some time with the prosecutor and I can't say I'm impressed. I think the kindest thing I can say is that it was like stepping back in time 30 years. The whole atmosphere seems to be one of complacency. The philosophy seems to be that if a murder doesn't detect itself fairly quickly, then well, we don't try very hard. If it's not easy, well, we don't bother with it. Uh, I found it quite remarkable that uh, here we are in 1996, saying that in 1990, a forensic examination wasn't as good as it is now. We're not talking about the Middle Ages, 1990 six years ago, that's all. Another disappointment was that the public don't really seem to feature in the ideas here of detecting crime, which I find disappointing and frankly a bit sad. Uh, I'm not just sad, it actually makes me angry and I'm not about to leave things there. I'm going to keep on demanding answers to some very awkward questions. We know that nothing can bring Joanna back but the parish family still deserve justice, not bungling inefficiency. In next month's programme, I'll be revealing how, even six years on, the French gendarmes could put Joanna's murderer behind bars. We're taking a break. Going on holiday? You should go to a place that will give you more holiday for your money. With our fantastic discounts, shouldn't you be going places with going places? The internet will be the biggest thing since the Industrial Revolution. The internet will be just a chat line for physicists and video game addicts. Someday your web address will be everything. One day on the internet, the Colonel's secret recipe will whiz past the secret formula for Pepsi. No one really knows what the internet will be. But we engineer systems that anticipate this vast uncertainty. So you can approach it as one huge opportunity. Digital, whatever it takes. I just saw this guy on the... hanging over the side of the bridge sort of thing. It doesn't matter what walk of life you come from. I then looked and thought, no, he's... he's gonna throw himself over. If you can spend a few hours a week to help others, and so I thought, well, I'll go and try and stop them. We'd like you to make inquiries. For information about training for the Special Constabulary of the Volunteer Police Service, ring 0345 272 272. Would you care to help? Pumping headache, muscle pain, flu symptoms. If pain strikes, hit back with sulfony. The power to hit pain where it hurts. Well, I suppose I'd better get the rest of this shopping unpacked. After all, she did buy me those jelly babies. By choosing all our Safeway savers, instead of the most popular alternatives in store, you could cut your shopping bill in half. In half? I should have held out for a sherbet dip. Cut your shopping bill in half with Safeway savers. 
chocolate? No. Not even. Every year, Delta fly more passengers than any other airline in the world. And that calls for a little synchronized flying. Delta Airlines. You love the way we fly. Video companies and authors are making millions out of murderous stories. Victims' relatives say it's a sick industry and should be banned. Our jury is still um, deciding. I, I find things which are true, two crimes rather ghoulish. And to be honest, I generally reach for the off switch if it's true life. There must be a, a long, many, many years before it's allowed out. Mm. If the whole family who are still alive no. Some don't agree. Say. It keeps coming up. Every yeah, year there's be. something. Some, some media intrusion, someone wants to know something. I'm sure if anything happened to my, any one of my daughters, I'd hate to think that anybody or film would film make anything of them. Do you watch the TV and, and look at something and just accept it and think, oh right, okay, I'm going to go and do that? You, no one does that. Everyone takes it in and thinks about it and processes the information. We don't just go out and copy everything that just goes straight on on television. I, I don't no, know. There are some. Yeah, but we're all different, aren't we? Yeah, mm. That's the operative word, some. If, if, if some do as a result of what they've been. And there's still a few minutes left for you to phone in with your vote. Now, last month we told you how your calls helped police catch one of Britain's most prolific armed robbers. Matthew Lachlan from Derby was dubbed Cagoule Man because he usually disguised himself with an anorak before committing his raids. He carried out robberies across the Midlands and the North, netting an estimated £100,000. Since our report, Lachlan has been sentenced to 12 years by a Crown Court judge. Police who spent two years tracking him down say they're delighted. And just to prove our international appeal, Crime Stalker has made the news in Turkey. Last year, we asked for your help in tracing this man, Sammy Lofty, who was wanted for deception offences by Nottingham detectives. Your calls helped police trace him to the Mediterranean, where he was allegedly carrying out similar crimes. He was eventually arrested by Turkish police, but escaped from custody and is on the run again. Turkish television featured crime stalker footage as part of their own appeal for help in tracking down Mr. Lofty. Nottinghamshire police say he may well be back in Britain. We'll keep you updated on any developments. John. Well now, it's a few years since I've worn one of these, but sadly the days of the old-fashioned Bobby's helmet may be numbered. My old force, Greater Manchester, is scrapping them in favour of flat caps, and we're told that other forces may follow. They say that they're hot, uncomfortable, and a target for hooligans to knock off. Well, in my day, we took pride in wearing the helmet. It offered good protection for the head, and some coppers, I might tell you, found it was very useful for keeping their supper time meat pies warm. Well, with me now is Stuart Nichols of the West Midlands Police Federation. Stuart, are you and I old sentimentalists? I mean, are the younger coppers thinking the same as we are? Well, I think we probably are old sentimentalists, but uh, I believe that, uh, personally speaking, that anything that's lasted as long as it has is worth preserving. And yet Greater Manchester have gone into it in great detail. It's a busy, big police force, very much like West Midlands. Why should they be wrong and the rest of uh, the country right? Well, from the Federation of the West Midlands point of view, safety is paramount. And only, only at this weekend, a, uh, at a local football match, a, an object was thrown at the police. It struck a policewoman on the head. Um, and as the construction is the same as the helmet, it uh, prevented any uh, head injury at all to her. So I believe as a safety point of view, there's no comparison with a hard helmet and the soft flat cap. Do you, th do you think that Greater Manchester might live to regret it, this decision? Well, I think there might be a, a wealth of public opinion against it because I think the public have, uh, see the uniqueness and they see that it is you, a policeman stands out in a crowd. Yes, they, they might rue the day they chose that decision. Mm. Because the flat cap, of course, as you've said, offers no protection at all. Yeah. So at some stage in the future, the, the Police Federation, if you're issued with these, are going to be calling for helmets perhaps to come back again. Well, that, that's as may be. Um, and I certainly see a flat cap as no replacement to a hard helmet for all its faults. Mm. But Stuart, uh, this has got a very precious place in my heart and I just hope, I hope, I agree with you, I hope that we keep it. Thanks for coming in, thanks for talking about it. It's a pleasure. And 
time now for our final set of appeals. Two partners in crime who are believed to be responsible for over £10,000 worth of deception offences have been snapped at work. They used a stolen credit card at Lloyds Bank in Stratford-upon-Avon to withdraw £300. Warwickshire detectives want to hear from anyone who recognises the man who has long ginger hair and his accomplice who has brown bobbed hair and what witnesses described as cat-like eyes. Can you help West Midlands police burst the bubble of two champagne shoplifters? When the store's empty, the crooks storm into the Sheldon branch of Victoria Wines in Birmingham. The first grabs a shop assistant and bundles her into the rear storeroom. Meanwhile, his mate leans over the counter and helps himself to cash and cigarettes. Still not satisfied, the final touch is stashing two bottles of champagne down his jacket. The men are black, one had dreadlocks, the other wore a spotted bandana, and both wore bomber jackets and jeans. There's a Crime Stoppers reward of up to £500 available for information which leads to their arrest and conviction. Thames Valley detectives want to talk to this man about a lorry of scrap metal stolen from Albion Place in Oxford, which later turned up in London. This picture was found in the lorry. It's taken from a big issue identity card which had been issued in Birmingham to Woody. If you know him, call our crime line now. Detectives from West Mercia are trying to trace these two perfume thieves. Here they are loitering by the makeup counter at Lloyd's Chemist in Stourport on Seven. When the coast is clear, one of them starts filling a shopping basket with over £500 worth of top quality perfume. The second crook then transfers the 20 bottles of Samsara and poison perfumes into his jacket. They're both clean cut and wearing shirts and ties. His pen is poised and this man is just about to write out a stolen cheque. He made it out for £3,000 and tried to cash it at Lloyd's Bank in the Market Square at Stafford. He didn't get away with the cash and with a picture of this quality, hopefully you won't let him get away with the crime. If you recognise him, please do call now. Well, should the true crime industry be banned? It's been an emotive debate, but it's time now to hear what our jury have decided. Mr Foreman, can you please stand and tell me what the verdict is? The verdict of the jury is 8 to 4 against banning the true crime industry. Well, thank you to you and to your colleagues for your time and your efforts this evening. And it's time now to learn what you at home have decided. Sam. Thanks, John. And that all-important viewer's verdict should be coming up on your screens now. Indeed it is, and you've gone against our jury. 70% of you think the true crime industry should be stopped. 30% of you think it shouldn't. And thanks to all of you who phoned in. Well, because of John's special report from France, we didn't have time to show our feature on the work of a police surgeon. But I promise you it will be in our next programme, which I believe is on the first Thursday in March. John, were you surprised at that? Not really, not really. It's very frequent that the, the people at home, the viewers at home, go against our jury here in the studio. Good, that's democracy, that's what it's all about. It sure is. Well, it was anyway, a great vote. how have you enjoyed yourself? Very much. That's we solved good. some crimes, I hope, tonight. Yeah, well, so I do as well. It's been an ambition, John. Yeah. It's been great working yeah. with you. Oh, I've enjoyed it as well. Well, it's almost time for us to go. See you uh, next month. Good night. Good night. If you've been a victim of a crime and need to talk to someone in confidence or need advice, call Victim Support on 0171 735 9166. Lines are open during office hours with a recorded message at all other times giving details of services in your area. See Sentext page 636 for details. From the pen of Catherine Cookson. It's me, Matthew. Nancy. You'd better come in. Matthew, she can't. She's yours. I can't take care of her no more. She's my daughter. She has no one else. She will never be my daughter. You'll see to the girl's well-being. If you don't, I'll take authority in the house and do it for you. Malice and loathing await Hannah in Catherine Cookson's The Girl. Friday at 9 on Central. 
nice car, shame about the shirts. Magnum PI is next, here on Central. Now you can have a bathroom cleaner from Domestos that not only removes soap scum and attacks lime scale, but does something else. It kills germs as well, just leaving behind a nice clean smell. Good to know, isn't it? New non-bleached Domestos bathroom. Hello, oh, love. Hi. Oh, thanks. Woman's Weekly. If you haven't looked at Woman's Weekly recently, you're in for a surprise. It's bigger and brighter, full of fresh ideas and fabulous features and short stories. You want me to change that, do you? No. But you can change the baby if you like. Pick it up and it's hard to put down. So take another look at Woman's Weekly. If there's one thing that makes Danish au pairs so popular, it's got to be... Danish bacon, Danish bacon, yummy, 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 yum. For flu symptoms this bad, take night nurse so you can get a good night's sleep. When you have a cold or flu, night nurse it better. But all doesn't look too happy, does she? And you know why that is, it's her birthday and the doormat's a bit light on birthday cards. Actually, what really happened was this. There were plenty of cards. Do you know why? It's me, Mum. Don't forget, Gran's birthday. Helen, before you go on holiday, send Gran a card, all right? I know you're broke, Tom, so I've got you a card. You can sign it when you come over, all right? I'd like to order some flowers, please. Don't ask me why women bring round more than men. Maybe they care more. I know one thing, though. When they care on the blower, things happen. Oh, the flowers are beautiful. And I had a lovely lot of cards. It's good to talk. <laughs> Behave yourself. Your only chance. But why me? Just do it. He's got a gun. Never mind the gun. Get to the bear. When you're one mucky problem, Jeff. one sensitive solution, and only one chance. We have to get it back before he misses it. There's a long bio tackles the toughest stains even on the softest bears first time. Don't wake him, Bay. In sensitive situations. Thanks, Dad. Person bio performs brilliantly, and it shows. Ladies and gentlemen, it's good news. DFS make you an offer that will not be matched. Britain's leading upholstery specialist offers you a huge choice of sofas, settees, chairs and suites. Factory direct prices on everything we make. A guarantee of quality and free delivery. And right now you can choose anything with confidence, pay nothing until September. No deposit. No interest. No payment. And, and then, then take four, four years interest-free interest credit. credit. An offer that will not be matched from DFS, Britain's leading upholstery specialist. OK, then, where are we going first? Beatles Hot Shots, the show where you, the public, supply the laughs. I remember when all this was just feels. Cut! Beatles Hot Shots prove how a camcorder mixed with creativity can turn you into a Spielberg. So move it! At the double! Saturday laughter at 8.15 on Central. Before that, at 7.15 on Saturday, Scylla sets up more blind dates. 